Hi there, and welcome to Basic Principles of Laboratory Medicine. I'm Dr. Alex, and this is the voiceover PowerPoint that goes with the in-class notes. If you were in Monday's class for week four, we already went through uh, to slide 26, and if you're in Thursday's class, we will go through up to slide 26, and then this will be your voiceover PowerPoints uh, to do on your own, and we'll talk about them next time. So, hematology review. Let's look at the discussion from the syllabus. We asked some questions on the syllabus. Why start with blood testing and what can be learned from a CBC with differential and what can't be? And these were in-class discussions in our section this week. The next point that we're going to address in this voiceover PowerPoint is, is blood the problem or the symptom and which is which? And also keep your eyes on the pluripotent stem cells. The clotting cascade and the question of uh, D-dimer versus Doppler ultrasound will be answered in a week, uh, the week five, I believe. So I apologize, as always, for the noise in the background. I have one home sick today and one that's always noisy. Okay, so is blood the problem or the symptom? To answer that question, we have to first consider how blood is made. Then we have to consider what blood does. So what is hematopoiesis? Well, that's the answer to how blood is made. And it's the process of formation, development, and differentiation of the formed elements that are found in whole blood. A steady blood cell population is maintained by producing new cells. And if we produce new cells, we have to destroy the old ones. All right, so where is hematopoiesis? Hematopoiesis happens in the bone marrow and the liver, the spleen, the lymph nodes, and the thymus. And you might see there that the liver and the spleen are considered extramedullary hematopoiesis and come into play when the bone marrow simply can't keep up. So where is hematopoiesis? The questions we want to ask ourselves are um, in embryonic, embryonic blood, where is hematopoiesis taking place versus in a human adult? And then from birth to death, where is our primary source of hematopoiesis? So if we look at the location, we can see that in fetal development, the structures that are involved in hematopoiesis are the yolk sac, the liver, the spleen, the thymus, the bone marrow, and lymph nodes. And then in childhood, hematopoiesis is confined to bones. And you can see there the flat bones of the skull, clavicle, sternum, ribs, vertebrae, pelvis, long bones of arms and legs. And then in adulthood from age 18 on, we're looking at hematopoiesis uh, from the sources of the axial skeleton and the proximal ends of the femur and the humerus. And those would be called the epiphyses. And if you haven't heard of the epiphyses yet in your program, you certainly will. The epiphyses are the ends of the long bones. The epiphyseal plates are those things you never want to have damaged in childhood fractures as they can result in permanent damage, shortening, uh, or a lack of growth of the bone. And the epiphyseal plate fractures are really get people excited when we're talking about kids. Also, epiphyseal plate growth uh, can help determine the age of uh, someone, if you're identifying, say you're in forensic um, pathology and you're trying to identify age of um, remains. So say you find skeletal remains and you want to be able to, uh, hopefully you don't find skeletal remains every day, but this is just to punctuate what the epiphyses can be used for. Those epiphyseal plates don't close until in your 20s. So if the epiphyseal plates are still unfused or unclosed, then this is a way to, um, to age uh, skeleton. Just a little useless trivia for you. Okay, so it's actually not useless at all. It's just completely irrelevant to the scope of this class. Function of the erythrocytes. Transports hemoglobin, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. And then red blood cell production. Well, red blood cell production is stimulated by something called EPO, erythropoietin. Under low oxygen tension in the kidneys, and low oxygen in bloodstream, or hypoxemia. And in the bone marrow, EPO activates the committed progenitor cells, or the colony forming units, um, for differentiation. All right, and then let's see. On this slide, we just see the necessary elements, nutritional requirements for erythropoiesis. And I think that's interesting there because, you know, you can see a lot of vitamins and things that you recognize are actually essential to make blood. And then on the next slide there, you can see red blood cells. We have a nice little cross-sectional view and a nice little top view. Looks a little bit like a junior mint if it were, you know, the chocolate colored. And then you can see hemoglobin, the beta uh, globins and the alpha globins. And you might note here that the facts on this particular slide are succinct but <coughs> useful. So erythrocytes, which are also called red blood cells, 
and there are biconcave discs that are flexible, and there's a plasma membrane but no nuclei or organelles, and they're packed with hemoglobin molecules, so they're the oxygen-carrying protein. So you got four chains of amino acids, and each has iron, which is the binding site for oxygen, and CO2 is also carried. The young ones still contain their ribosomes, and that's the reticulocytes. The, um, and this is going to, I'll show you a picture of a reticulocyte here in a few slides, and you'll be able to see the ribosomes that are still present, and you can see why you can tell the difference in those. And the uh, red blood cells live for 100 to 120 days. The next slide there, we're just looking at um, erythropoiesis from the blast stage all the way down to when it is a red blood cell. And you can see the, the polychromatic, uh, polychromatophilic erythrocyte um, there by the reticulocyte. And then erythroblastic islands. You can note that there's a macrophage nurse, nurse cell cartoon drawn there. I like to think of the uh, macrophage nurse cells out there in their little nurse hats. Macrophage surrounded by concentric rings of maturing normoblasts. And then the macrophages supply the developing red blood cells with iron for the hemoglobin synthesis. So that's a nice little symbiotic relationship the macrophage nurse cells have with um, the developing blood cells. And then erythropoiesis takes five days. Uh, the nucleus extrudes, and that um, is your polychromatophilic erythrocyte, classified as a reticulocyte when you stain it. The name comes from the stain, and it's larger than the mature red cell. It matures out there in circulation, and then the average red blood cell stays in circulation for about 120 days. And again, the morphology of the retics or reticulocyte is that they're larger than the mature circulating red blood cells, and they contain, contain ribosomal RNA fragments, and that's what appears as those little bits of blue string. And the hemoglobin production is completed at that point, and they usually present in bone marrow for um, about two to three days, usually present in the bone marrow for about two to three days, and usually a 1% circulating red blood cells are reticulocytes. I feel a little bit like I'm doing combat uh, voiceover PowerPoints because I have the two-year-old uh, dancing around in his diaper, stomping his feet, making all kinds of noise, and the nine-year-old laying here with her head basically on the computer. So let's see how this sounds when it's all done. The next slide there, we have the reticulocyte that turns into a mature erythrocyte. And you can see a super vital stain, the methylene blue of the reticulocyte, and you can see that ribosomal package still present. Red blood cell breakdown, well, red blood cells usually live about 120 days, plus or minus 20 days. And with age, these ribosome, or excuse me, these red blood cells have several changes that occur. The red blood cell membrane starts to lose form and gets damaged, and there's a, in, a decrease in enzymes, ATP, in size, and an increase in de density. And so at that point, it's time to take out the red blood cells. So who takes those out? The spleen. The extravascular red blood cells, 90%, are removed by the spleen. And then the intravascular, which is 10%, are destroyed in the peripheral circulation. All right, so if you're outside the vasculature, extravascular, you're removed by the spleen, and that comprises 90%. If you're inside the vasculature, that's 10%, you're destroyed in peripheral circulation. And then the mononuclear phagocyte system, or MPS, is what degrades the red blood cells. And then each day, 1% of the old red blood cells in circulation are removed. Here's a nice slide of the keep your eyes on the pluripotent stem cell. So you see that we have a pluripotent stem cell that breaks into a myeloid multipotent stem cell, or else a common lymphoid stem cell. And then that myeloid multipotent stem cell goes down to a unipotent progenitor cell, which can then turn into our white blood cells, our thrombocytes, our erythrocytes, and then off the offshoot of the erythrocytes are the, is the erythropoietin. So we're looking at white blood cells, platelet, platelets, and red blood cells. And the only thing we see on that lymphoid line is lymphocytes. Keep your eyes on the pluripotent stem cells. So the pluripotent stem cells proliferate as well as differentiate into the types of blood cells that we have in our bodies, and they're self-renewing. And the multipotential stem cells are the myeloid and lymphoid. And so if we look forward, there's the myeloid line and there's the lymphoid line. So we start up there with our hunk of metal, as we use the description in class, the analogy in class. And we start to differentiate down to what we're going to ultimately turn into. 
And if we have a hunk of metal at the top and down there at the very bottom, we want to end up with a Buick and a Volkswagen and a Ferrari and a Lexus. And then we have to go through all the steps to get to the end result. So you can see the myeloid stem cells have a whole line and the lymphoid stem cells just turn into lymphocytes. All right, so the myeloid side, erythrocytes, there's your red blood cells, your granulocytes, neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, and our monocytes, which are monocyte macrophages. And then we have megakary megakaryocytes that turn into platelets. So monocyte macrophage. Let's go back and look at that. Where's our monocyte macrophage? So you can see that a myeloid stem cell goes to an immature monocyte and then to a mature monocyte. And so then... When does that monocyte turn into a macrophage? And some of you that have read ahead and, you know, remember your um, other courses, you have still have some brain power to remember, you know that the monocyte then turns into a macrophage when needed. And we're going to talk about that. And on the uh, lymphoid side, all we have are lymphocytes. Next, we have leukocytes, a.k.a. white blood cells. And these are complete cells that function outside the blood. And um, note the size difference compared to erythrocytes. So we have neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, small lymphocytes, and monocytes. So that is our leukocyte population. And there's five different types of white blood cells. And they're classified according to the presence or absence of the granules and the staining characteristics of their cytoplasm. So leukocytes appear brightly colored in stained preparations. They have a nuclei and are generally larger in size than red blood cells. Let's go back and look at that. Brightly colored, yep, check. Bigger than red blood cells, yep, check. Okay, what else are we talking about? A nuclei, yep, check. Okay, so we cannot confuse red blood cells with white blood cells. Just not possible. All right, especially in a healthy population. There's another slide of lymphocyte, monocyte, eosinophil, basophil, and neutrophil. All right, never let monkeys eat bananas is my acronym that I like so much, and that's because that's the relative concentration of those cells in the human body. All right, so types of white blood cells. Again, here's our granulocytes. They have the large granules in their cytoplasm. So we're looking at neutrophils, eos, and basophils. So there's neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, and you see the granular nature and why they might call that a granulocyte. And then, there we go, there's a basophil, a neutrophil, and an eosinophil. And then the types of white blood cells again, agranulocytes, they don't have granules in their cytoplasm. Let's go back to that slide again. There you go, no granules. Well, none to speak of. All right, lymphocytes and monocytes. And here they are, agranulocytes. All right. And granulocytes, neutrophils, stain light purple with neutral dyes. So we're talking about neutrophils now. And their granules are small and numerous, and they're very coarse in appearance. And they have several lobes in the nucleus, and they comprise 65% of your white blood count. So the never, and the never let monkeys eat bananas, 65%. Highly mobile, very active. They can diapodese. They can leave the blood vessels and enter the tissue space. It's so awesome. And they can also um, perform phagocytosis. They eat things, contain several lysosomes. So they eat stuff and they clean up after themselves or other parts in the body. All right, and there's a neutrophil. There's a nice picture of a neutrophil. And then here's our phagocytosis features. So we can see there in A, we have lysosomes, there's a cell receptor, our nucleus, our surface ligand, and a foreign particle. And if you don't recognize anything else from this cartoon, you might notice that the, um, that the cell is opening up and swallowing that other thing. Okay, so that's pretty easy to tell what phagocytosis might mean when you look at the pictures. And granulocytes are eosinophils. Granulocytes are large, numerous, granuled cells with a nuclei that has two lobes. And they are 2 to 5% of our white blood cell count. And they're found in the lining of the respiratory and the digestive tract. And it's, very, it's going to become very important later in your pathological, pathological, I hope you're not pathological, in your career considering pathology. The important functions involve protections against infection caused by parasitic worms and the involvement in allergic reaction. 
So they secrete an anti-inflammatory substance in allergic reactions. And there is an eosinophil. It's that word association game. I hear eosinophil, I think allergy. All right, next is basophils, our other granulocyte. They're the least numerous, 0.5 to 1%. They can also leave the blood vessel and enter tissue space, and they contain histamine, which is an inflammatory chemical. Histamine, that thing that makes you have the allergic like wheel on your arm if you go and get blood tested and they always give you a um, they give you a control histamine pinprick so they put these drops of things on your skin and then one of those drops will be the control to see if you can actually mount a histamine reaction and they'll prick through it with the pen or the needle and you get this big welt and that is how they note that you actually can have an allergic reaction so those are basophils all right there's a picture of the basophil and next we have our A granulocytes. We'll begin with lymphocytes. And they're the smallest white blood cells. And they have a large nuclei and a small amount of cytoplasm. Um, they account for 25% of our white blood count. And there's two types. The T lymphocytes attack and infect or cancerous cells. Uh, and the B lymphocytes produce antibodies against specific antigens, like foreign bodies. And there's a picture of the A granulocyte. You can see the large... Nucleus to cytoplasm ratio, okay, large nuclei, small amount of cytoplasm, large nuclei, small amount of cytoplasm. Next we have monocytes. They're the largest of the white blood cells. Dark kidney bean shaped nuclei and they're highly phagocytic, okay, so there they are. Kidney bean shaped, highly phagocytic. They even look like they're in the I'm going to eat you position. All right, white blood cell numbers, count the number of white blood cells in a blood sample. And this is called the differential. So a decrease in the number of white cells is, is uh, termed leukopenia, and an increase is termed leukocytosis. All right. And then what about the lowly platelet? Well, the platelet is nothing except awesome. It's definitely not lowly. Without it, I think we might bleed to death. So the platelet, not cells, they're small fragments broken off from megakaryocytes. Megakaryocytes. So if you look there... Um, and find megakaryocyte, you can see that the platelet line came directly from the uh, myeloid stem cell down to the megakaryoblast, down to the pro-megakaryocyte, down to the megakaryocyte, and then all the way down to platelets. And those are important in forming clots in our damaged vessels. And when you watch my, um, let's see, I believe it's my brother's YouTube that's on blood, no, it's not Clotting Cascade, that's a, a different YouTube on Clotting Cascade that's really fantastic. So when you watch that, you'll understand um, a little bit more about clots. Uh, platelets are also called thrombocytes. And megakaryocytes, you can see again the, what I just told you. You can also follow the picture on down till you get a platelet. They have a unique maturation process. And note that the megakaryoblast is unable to divide. With maturation, the nucleus becomes multilobulated and polyploid and the cytoplasmic volume increases, after which the cytoplasmic granules form. Okay, so let's go back and look at that picture again. All right. And formation of white blood cells revisited. Leukocytes are formed in the red marrow of many bones. They can also be formed in lymphatic tissue, and they live for only 13 to 20 days. Normal cell maturation results in changes in the cytoplasm, the nucleus, and the cell size, and the progression between the stages is gradual and simultaneous. Why do we want to look at these? Because disease states often equal asynchronous cells, and we'll talk about that in class. The asynchronous cells that are seen under microscopic evaluation. Mature cells, normally only mature cells are in circulation, some migrate to other tissues before reaching maturity, like, for example, the thymus. And many mature cells are found in the peripheral spaces, like the lymphatics and the endothelial walls and tissue space. And that ends our voiceover PowerPoint. Our class exercise beginning next week will be to discuss platelet ac activation. So if you're interested in having a little look at platelet activation before you get to class. That would be awesome. Otherwise, have a really great rest of your day.